screen. Okay, so welcome to this session in Tonight's Roots and Resilience. Now we're going to hand over to Anita and the rest of the group to present their session. Over to you guys. This is the rest of the group. <laughs> <laughs> this is Helen. Um, so thanks. It's really nice to be back with the Zulipis. Um, we were scrambling about trying to figure out how to get on. So we're a little bit kind of, um, ah, we're here now. <laughs> Uh, so Transition Town Wellington, we're based in the southwest of England. Um, if you can imagine the country and you head down southwest towards Cornwall, we're not quite as that far down, but we're in the southwest. We're, uh, but it's a small town, 14 or so thousand people, and Transition Town Wellington has been going for actually about 50 years, no, 12 years, something like, years, like, that. Something like 2008, that. Yeah, 14 years. 14 years. Um, but just recently, we have kind of gone exponentially upwards, uh, largely spearheaded by the various community gardening projects that we've been doing across town. Um, yeah, we've got about eight or nine different sites around town that we're, we and a, our team of volunteers uh, look after. And the, the latest, or the, uh, not the latest, but the biggest one that we have undertaken so far is to create a forest garden on a site called Fox's Field, which is um, what we're going to talk to you about tonight. Um, Helen and I have done a presentation so we can show you some of the pictures and just do a very, we don't want to be death by, death by PowerPoint, um, but it's quite nice to be able to show you some of the people that have been involved and, and the kind of process that we went through, because um, I think when we were on Rakesh's course with uh, four of our colleagues, um, there were quite a lot of people on the course with very different kinds of areas that they were managing. Um, we have been trying to uh, manage a site which is a very, very well used very public site so a lot of our work has been I, th I would say probably as much work as we've done on the actual horticultural side we've kind of been doing on the community building communications social kind of side because it's it requires it that kind of site so um, I am going to try and share my screen and then we can um, take you through the presentation. So uh, yeah, Vanessa, Helen, myself, Andreas and Steve were the people who did the forest garden course with Rakesh. So we've been the kind of forest garden crew. Um, as many of you I'm sure know about Rakesh's um, sociocracy kind of dragon dreaming model where you do uh, dreaming and then you do planning and then you do doing and then you do celebrating um, and different people within the group have uh, a variety of different strengths. Um, I am basically a celebrator, <laughs> <laughs> Helen's basically a planner and a doer and we're both a dreamers um, and all of us I think have used elements of all of those four things at each phase of the project. Um, this, was, this was June 2021, um, and it was the first day that we were actually on the field doing some work with, with our scythes. Um, and we were basically scything down a huge nettle patch. And we wanted to mark the moment really because it had been the culmination of probably nearly two years of uh, planning, of campaigning, of meeting, of doing all sorts of things which had resulted in the field, which had been put up, it was, it was, it was privately owned and it had been put up for development, um, for sale. And the local community got together and basically said, this is a really beautiful, well-loved, green, open, glorious space, and we don't want it to be built on. Um, and we won. We managed. We, you know, it was a great, it was a great victory for us, I think. 
Um, and when we, so when we first got down on the field with our scythes, um, I had a little kind of uh, sheath of um, sage and sweet grass that uh, we thought would be appropriate to just kind of mark the moment of setting off on this potentially 99 year journey um, with a little blessing. So we asked the fields to be happy and to flourish and to bless our work and all the people that were going to enjoy the fruits of our labors and all of that. And it was just a really nice, it was a really nice little moment to mark the beginning of the journey. Um, we then embarked upon a series of uh, public consultations uh, to try and involve as many people as we could in the dreaming, I think, aspect of um, the project. And one of the most important things, or one of the most engaging things I think that people did was to really relate to this um, lovely painting that one of our local residents did for us of what, imagining what the field might be like in 10, 20, 30 years time. Um, and this, actually, the town council gave us the opportunity of having it as, as a window wrap. So it's absolutely huge on a shop in the high street. So it was a really public um, place. And a lot of people got very inspired by this kind of vision of the future, really. Um, for the public consultation day, for the third public consultation day that we did, we did two on Zoom because it was during lockdown and the third one was in real life and um yeah I must, I must say the first zoom that we had was um possibly my favorite because we um had different people in the community giving their ideas in breakout rooms and all that sort of stuff was quite new to us we, because of lockdown we sort of learned all new technology and stuff and it was so helpful actually um doing that and um i think we were all completely buzzing after about an hour and a quarter of um, people that we've never met before essentially really getting on board and having essentially the same ideas that we were having um, but from a fresh set of people and it was so exciting that first um, Zoom that we had. It was Even also it terrifying because yeah. we didn't know how anything worked. <laughs> yeah. I think we had about 80 people yeah about 80 people yeah. yeah and we we sort of collated all this information of what people have put on comments forms and from that uh, meeting to then go to the next couple of um consultations so sort of, you know um information meetings that we were doing in fact um uh so i'm just gonna scroll through so this was um one of the boards that we created out of the first two public consultations um for the third one which was really um, trying to capture some of that, the mm. variety of what people were saying and what they were after. And um, a lot of people were really concerned about accessibility. Um, it's a very muddy, difficult field to get to unless you're really fit and you have a lot of waterproofs on. Um, <laughs> people wanted more space for wildlife. Uh, they wanted a place to kind of gather, to have diverse events, to bring people together, community gatherings, a sustainable play park, um, exercising equipment, maybe ponds, water, you know, dogs, dogs are a very big part of this field, so everything has to be quite dog friendly. Um, so yeah, this, this kind of gives you an idea of um, the sort of feedback we were getting. Um, and, and also how we sort of visually presented it. So the green bars that you can see are to do with um, plants and, and trees and stuff. The blue bars that you can see are to do with people and accessibility and infrastructure type stuff. And the purple things are to do with food and something. Anyway, it all activities for activities children. Activities for children. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, it was all um, good fun. And um, yeah, the, so, but one of the things that we learned or that we had to learn as we were going along really was um, most people don't know what a forest garden is. And if we as a group who had some inkling about it came in and said, oh, we want to create a forest garden. For, for most people in the town, that would have immediately suggested a closed canopy forest. 
Um, and so whenever the phrase came up, we were really careful to try and say that it's not just planting a lot of trees on the site. Because as you can see from the image in the middle of the um, in the middle of the uh, board here, this is what we're really talking about from the tree line at the top of the image right the way down to the railway track at the other end. So, um, and in fact, also this little field to the right hand side, it's right next to this incredibly beautiful, huge, uh, derelict 19th century mill. Um, very, very iconic kind of building and a really beautiful site. So most people, when they heard the word forest, were anyone who had a negative reaction was saying, oh, but it's a really nice meadow, it's really open, we don't want loads of trees all over it, it'll ruin the view, blah, blah, blah. So that was one of the things that we had to be quite careful about. So we've sort of done a, a, a probably more than 50% of the site is still sort of meadow as it were. Um, I think the, the whole site's eight acres and the actual forest garden's on about an acre and a half. Um, so, but we're not actually making, we're aiming to get some of the meadow to be more biodiverse by actually managing it properly um, as a wildflower meadow, but um, some of it we're not managing at all. So it's probably in thirds maybe, um, third forest garden and third meadow and third left done, you know, messy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So we did a lot of um, site analysis first. That was um, quite in-depth uh, looking at the infrastructure that's on the field. So there is a uh, water pipeline that goes underneath it. There's a power line that goes over the top. We looked at sun and shade patterns. Um, we did some fairly basic but quite good soil analysis to have a look at um, the kind of things that might like to grow there. Uh, we looked at what was what the existing trees and um, surroundings were like and also what the contours were like. Yeah we did get a really in-depth soil analysis from um, an ecologist and none of us really understood it <laughs> but apparently it was fine. That's <laughs> fine. Things grow there. Um, the other thing that we, we, we really took a lot of care of and this is Helen's thing really is the historic views, the views and vistas. Yeah, there was there was quite a lot of limitations into where we actually put the forest garden because um, people really like the views of the factory. I mean, it's such a beautiful building. Um, also, um, the views of the surrounding fields, and also there's um, the Wellington Monument. Is is it the tallest three sided obelisk in Europe? Or something? It's the tallest three sided the obelisk in Europe. <laughs> something like that. Um, a... And um, so it's probably quite important to um, people in Wellington. And it's two and a half miles away, but there's one patch in the field where you can see it. And so we didn't want to put any massive trees in the way of this view. So actually, when you started designing the site, you've got two power lines you've got the water main that you're not supposed to you're supposed to be able to leave it so that they can dig up the pipe at any point and you know so really you don't want to put a nice tree where where they might destroy it in the future um, and then you've got the views of the various bits and then the view of the monument it it did curtail what exactly you could put where and was quite a big factor in the design um if anyone wants to ask any question i mean feel free to stop us and <laughs> shout out because otherwise we'll just burble on um so yeah but so on the one of the main things that people were really keen on was um having a good good habitat for wildlife um so this was just one of the boards about some of the species that you can find here and um it was nice because it dovetailed with another um campaign that we were running at the time called uh gardening for wildlife. So the little logos that you can see along the top of this board um, are taken from a wildlife map and wildlife gardening for wildlife booklet that we were also doing at the time. So it kind of all felt like it was all dovetailing together quite nicely. I think that actually um, increased the people in Wellington's um, knowledge of our group existing. Yeah. Um, you know, got a whole different set of people involved and interested. Um, and, and once we did that work, we sort of set it up so that all of the things that people wanted, the answer to that 
was a forest garden. That was how, so we didn't want to come across like we kind of pre-decided everything, but actually having had a look at all of the um, wants and needs and ideas and dreams that people had, the best way of answering most of those was in fact to create a, a forest garden on part of the site. Mm. Um, so that's that's the sort of trajectory of how we kind of got everyone on board really, mm. hopefully. I mean, I think a forest garden can fulfill everybody's dreams and all the wildlife's wants and needs and, and everything. I mean, we all know this, don't we? Um, and I think, um, I mean, the only thing that it wouldn't fulfill is somebody wanting a BMX track or a, you know, load of houses and those things weren't allowed on that site anyway. So it felt like anything that would have been allowed on the site would could be feel, fulfilled by um, what we were doing. So it was nice, nicely open. Trying to explain that to people, I suppose, is the uh, the challenge. But I think it it's really nice to be able to <clears throat> talk to people about growing plants that are for eating, for healing and for making. And so this idea of everything can everything has its place and it's um, yeah, it's got sort of multiple uses. I think that's what comes across quite nicely in those very simple words. So uh, for the for the third public consultation, we had this strange chap here who came and talked to us, which was lovely. Um, we had all of the presentation boards set out on a, in a kind of marquee, and we had a lot of people and. It was a really, really lovely what day. It was it's about 200, wasn't it? Yeah, it was something like 200. And at the end of it, we had a really nice um, load of vegan calzone from a local food supply, which was which we all needed by that point. Yeah. Oh, and beer. I think no cider. Cider, cider yeah. from um, <laughs> it ben. had to be cider, yeah. didn't it, from Somerset? <laughs> so that was that was just great. Um. I'm not going to give you that one. Anyway, so... So shall I talk about that a little bit? Let's you, you have it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think as uh, people that are interested in Forest Garden, hopefully you'll um, be interested in a bit more detail about the actual plan. Um, so can you see the cursor? Yeah. They can see the cursor, great. So um, I was saying before about the limitations that we had. Um, so this line down here, which runs across to, where's it go out? it's down there, is the view to the monument. Um, and so these large walnuts at the end um, are very far away and it's also going slightly uphill. So by the time you've got perspective into the picture, um, we felt like sort of from about there onwards, we didn't really have to worry too much about the height. However, everything back from there is generally under six meters. Um, the fruit trees and things like that um, are under six meters so that, um, you, that we didn't have to worry about the, um, the view being blocked. Um, the blue line is the pipe. So we've got, we've put a footpath provisionally there. I mean, there's gonna be a million footpaths, I'm sure, once we've actually done the ground cover um, design. Um, but, you know, to have, have at least one um, going in and out, we've put another entrance up here. So there's three entrances um, and the power line goes along here. So then, again, that was a notion of where we could put the big trees. Um, and so what we did when we first planted the site, we've, we've gone for a fedge um, all the way along the footpath because we liked, we, we sort of have aspirations in the future of making all of the, the footpath that goes in a loop around the field to be accessible for um, everyone and wheelchairs and push chairs and things like that. Um, but to make a path like that, you need to pave it somehow. Um, and I think the first quote, we've got something like 35 grand because it's massive. <laughs> so that's not gonna happen anytime soon. And I can't imagine, well, you know, I say that I'm hoping it will happen in the next couple of years, but it's not gonna be a quick job. But it would be really nice for anybody that is using that path, um, because we're not likely to have paved paths anywhere around the actual middle of the forest garden. But we want them to be able to get to as many different types of food as possible and really feel like part of the 
whole thing. So um, we've got forest garden trees either side um, and um, the fetch has loads of different bushes um, for mainly fruit bushes, but unusual ones as well as common ones like gooseberries and um, black currants. We've got things like um, low growing sumac, but nothing that really gets above a couple of meters so that it's not shading out um, anything too much. And also so you can see over it um, and see the sort of trees inside um, and fruit trees on the other side of the path as well to pick from. So um, that's that side. And we, we ended up putting a little rope fence because we wanted to try and have minimal um, protection from people and dogs and things like that, uh, make it look really nice. But unfortunately, we got thwarted by rabbits as soon as we planted everything. So we've ended up having to put little wire cages around um, the things they were eating, which was um, some of the sort of um, more expensive little bushes. Um, but along this edge is the windbreak. Um, and also along this edge here, and this is a hedge. So it's essentially surrounded by a windbreak on all sides. Um, but our, uh, there's a really strong north, northwest, is it east? Northeasterly mm. wind um, that comes in between February and May when all the blossoms out. So we definitely needed to protect from this side. Um, here we've got, that was a little remnant of the view tour because from here, if you can see my cursor, there's a lovely view of the factory. But when we were walking around the field, looking at all the different views, there just became a point where it's like, well, if we save all the views, we can't have any trees. <laughs> so um, we've actually gone for a seating area that's just basically further in. Um, so closer to the view that you're looking at, but nobody really went in the middle of the field before. So it's a new view, but it will have the same proportions of the uh, factory for photos and things like that. So um, in the future, maybe we'll have some sort of tower up here where you can see above all the trees. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I think I think that's about it. We've got um, lots of different types of tree in there. This area here is more south facing. So we've got all our um, tender um, warmth wanting trees and we've got more of a nuttery around here generally the nuts I put in dark brown and then um, over here and along the edge we've got more sort of common garden orchard trees like plums and pears and cherries and things and um, a sort of herbal suggested herbal area up there which um, a herbal school called botanica botanica is hopefully going to um, design the ground cover layer Okay, okay. Yeah. shall we move on? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I get excited about the planning, so I'm the planning person. <laughs> so then uh, in September we started mowing and had a total disaster. The mower hit a rain cover that we didn't know about and he didn't know about and nobody knew about. Um, so there was a bit of a panic and um, we had to compensate the farmer who'd come with his tractor to, to actually mow the ground um, for his additional costs. Yeah, we thought it, we, to be, I don't think we had to really, but we offered because we, offered. It, we just felt so awful and we had to pay <laughs> £250 excess, so we yeah. just covered it because we um, wanted him to come back. He was really nice. <laughs> yeah, he was very nice about it. To he be was fair. very nice about and it. And then that, that experience meant that we then spent the next couple of weeks getting loads of people onto the field with sticks and rays and poke things and metal detectors and just kind of trying to scan as much as we could of the ground. And it was, it was like a really big litter pick. Um, <laughs> We did footballs yeah. and yeah, we found one big iron rod. Yeah, we did exciting. find a two foot massive iron bar that might have been part of the problem. Yeah. Um, um, and then this this is this is actually probably one of my favourite maps because it looks like a kind of Renaissance star map or such star chart, where you've got every single tree in a triangulation with every single other tree, um, all yeah. thanks to this control freak <laughs> well i mean um you uh, if you're designing something it's got to kind of be at least slightly near the design that you started with um and the only thing that we had to go off was this line at the bottom which is a straight fence 
by the side of the railway. Um, we didn't actually know exactly where the hedge was. We went off Google Earth, which is pretty inaccurate, really. Um, and so the first thing that we did was we I did 90 degrees off this fence. And so we worked out how to do 90 degrees with Pythagoras. Um, and then once we'd started with that, we did two long tapes so that you had um, the same number on each one. So you know that you're the same with the longest line and then went out and did the first lot of trees, the first row of trees. Um, that took about a day. <laughs> um, and then we did have three tape measures and we triangulated all of the other plants on this thing. Um, and something I'm really pleased with was that where the water pipe was, we haven't had to move any trees. It all ended up being in the right place. We were about two meters off where this gate was. So I'm really pleased with that. I think if you... Um, and especially because we did you know. we did that with divining rods. <laughs> yeah, we knew where we knew where that end and that end was because of the drain cover, but this end we didn't actually know. Um, but yeah, and then um, when we got to this end, the pines weren't quite in the place we thought they were. So we were supposed to have a couple of ginkgo biloba's at this end, uh, which we had to move and make the whole thing a little bit shorter because we didn't. One of the views was of these historic pines and oaks. They've been there for years. They're on the old tithe maps of 1600 and whenever. So um, we didn't want to block this view um, from the other path or put trees right in front of them. So um, we were about 10 meters out when we got to the end, but that was because I think we thought the pines were in a different place um, and we've since discovered that the hedge is further out than we thought it was so we can fit some more trees in so we're getting another eight trees along this edge but I mean I think if you start with theory that you're going to try and do it as possible any inaccuracies aren't that bad <laughs> but that's I don't know that's my OCD I guess <laughs> it's really really accurate and we went through how many tubes of spray paint oh god that was the one environmental disaster I wasn't very happy with but we we um <laughs> we started putting stakes in the ground and somebody came up with the idea because if you fall on a stake then it can have your eye out and it's so public so we put tennis balls on top of the stakes because we thought that was a good idea and then the dogs <laughs> nicked them all <laughs> And then we, we found some little bottles that could go on the end of the stick. So, I mean, I'd say in the future, I think you do need a paint and stick because um, by the time we planted everything, it was about two months when the last tree went in from when the first marker was put. Um, and so I was finding like the tiniest bit of spray paint that marked a tree. And I was so grateful that we did it like, belts and braces we put a number on each tree so the bottles and the tennis balls had numbers on them but we managed to keep track about it just about but it was hilarious <laughs> trying to do all of this and Helen with her huge map and her slide rule and yeah. three of us triangulating everything I and think I think we out. have gone a bit big um we weren't on doing such a lot of tree planting but the thing is give you money for tree planting um and we'd we'd done one design and then the council went oh can we give you another two grand please um so which is great um and i'm not being ungrateful but um people do like to see trees planted so i think that's why we've ended up getting more trees in but i quite like that even though we'll do all the ground cover and all the um, different things in like um guilds and try and get more people involved with the specific planning of each bit at least we've got the trees in so they can be growing and getting bigger um so the next few slides are just the list of some of the trees um it's the so is basically the windbreak, the fedge, um, and the standalone trees. So if anyone wants to have a closer squint at those, we can always come back to those. But I think that'll give you a kind of idea of the um, range of different plants that we've got in there. Um, and using um, Rakesh's uh, nutrient calculator was really yeah. good as well um so yeah so that's the standalone trees then then we had the very thrilling thing of going to collect the trees or uh, the trees yeah yeah this was a them. delivery from one supplier um, um and we went down to totnes i think three times in the end 
Yeah, um, we've got quite a lot of the trees from the Agroforest Research Trust down there and a couple of other suppliers. Yeah, as well. we, so we found there's an organic um, tree nurse, um, you know, orchard tree supplier quite locally about half an hour away. So then we had our first community planting days in, Dece in December uh, where we had just a fantastic turnout, lots of people. The weather was quite cold, but, but everyone came and we had a really great time. Helen did a fantastic demonstration of how you use cardboard and mulch around the trees. And um, there's the rope fence that we decided to have, which actually looks really, really nice. Um, and that was that was planting out the fedge mostly. I mean, one one benefit of having um, a meadow that you're looking after right next to the forest garden is that we do have a lot of um, mulch material in the grass. So we're working on basically using it to cover up as much of the um, grass in the forest garden area as we can to um, suppress it for next year. And just some more. Small random pictures of people. <laughs> um, that was, we did a whole load of um, little short videos of people just asking like why they're there and how are they finding it and everything. So we've got all these up on our website now, which is really lovely. Yeah, if you go on um, either ttw.org.uk or you go on YouTube and look up Transition Town Wellington, then all those little videos are there. So here you can see some of the tennis balls <laughs> and the little bottles and the numbering and everything and the dogs. <laughs> um oh now i put yeah so we're pretty much at the end of the, the the story in a sense but what we wanted to also just tell you about was that on the strength of the fox's field project which as you can see on this map is right at the top the farmer one of the farmers in wellington who actually owns this huge amount of land which is which everyone has kind of assumes is anyway public land mostly because yeah. it's crisscrossed with footpaths and dogs, yeah. loads of dogs. Um, so he actually offered the council the opportunity to buy this land um, and maintain and ma in order to maintain it as a green corridor. Yeah. So, so so sorry, go on. Um, I was going to say that um, the on this plan here. This bit of this bit is an allotment that the council owns, um, and here is where uh, the sports federation wanted to have some football pitches, um, and we recently found somebody who wanted to do a community supported agriculture um, small holding farm for the town, and he won he had his eye on this bit, um, and basically Adam who does the um, community farm approached um, Colin asking him to buy the land uh, asking if he'd sell the land or rent the land. And the Sports Federation had already been in contact. And um, the farmer, I remember, said to me in about January, a couple of years ago, you guys just need to have a meeting and sort out what you want. Um, and so that's basically what we did. And because the council was on board with what we'd done at Fox's Field, I think that really helped to get momentum going. And the fact that so many interest groups were wanting to do things um, and just to give you an idea of what this means for our little town um i've done a really really shitty but i hope <laughs> representative map <laughs> so the um one ear of this rabbit is fox's field this is pretty much the green corridor land that we were talking about and the other ear is yet another field which is a really beautiful sloping field on the other side of the railway line which the town council has now bought. So together, all of these sites mean that we now have nearly 75 acres of land, which is specifically meant for improving biodiversity um, and being you know, open green space for the community. So it's been a really, really exciting time for us um, here at Transition Town in Wellington. <laughs> Here's a very bad pun about mulch. Um, and yeah, and I hope we have some time for any questions now. And I'll yeah, put we the do. Line, Tom. So yeah, you guys have got about five minutes left of questions. Thanks for the presentation. Lovely.
So does anyone have any questions they would like to ask? I think there's a hand up in Sweden. Uh, uh, oh. Oh, hang on. Let's go back there. <laughs> How do you plan to share the products of the garden? Like, yeah. who will be harvesting and where will it go? And Mm. Yeah, you could. Um, well, we've um, we've got with the um, we have a foraging map of the town with the different sites that we've planted up, um, which we're just um, uh, redoing to have Fox's Field on there, so people know where it is. And um, we've actually just spent the last um, two and a half months writing a, a booklet um, of it. They are the more common garden fruit because um, the forest garden hasn't really been developed yet, but it's the things that are available in the rest of the town as well as um, on Fox's Field. Anita's just trying to um, find- Can I show you, can I thing. show you, can I show you? It's very, very lovely. We're very proud of this. It hasn't really, it's actually in my van. We've got it today. <laughs> it's just been printed. <laughs> I haven't even seen it myself yet in real life. <laughs> wow. um, but okay. yeah, we've, um, this is to basically give out free to the residents and the school children of Wellington to um, show them how to, how to identify, how to pick, how to cook, um, and where to find the free food that's available for everyone. So. So I'm just going to, ooh, I'm very excited about this. This is a great question. Thank you. <laughs> um, so do I'm you just, guys mean then that you won't like organize officially any kind of harvesting? You'll leave it to smaller groups who are using this area to, to pick what they want? I think so. Yeah. I mean, um, we'd, we'd like it if people just help themselves. Um, we've got a dream in the um, sustainable food group, um, which is a subgroup of the transition to town, that everybody would have free food around the corner from their house. And obviously this is a big corner, um, but we're also trying, uh, we're just getting a bit more permission from the councils to have residents nominating trees they want planted near them in little bit patches of green space. So um, we're hoping that it will be a thing in the future. I think you can just plan for the future, can't you, of climate change and, you know, if people are hungry and want some food, then they'll go and get it. You know? So for each of the... Um fruit or nuts or whatever that we've got in here you can you can see we've done tables you know when to harvest where to find them and what to use them for and each one has a recipe along with it along with some tips for what else it could be used for um so we've got crab apple apples pears um quinces cherry all of these um illustrations have been hand drawn by this lady here and I think that they're absolutely beautiful. Um, and each of them has a little icon next to it so that that relates to the forest thing that which we're wishing at the moment. So I, mean, I yeah. think in the future, especially with the more unusual things, then we will be doing cookery events and actually guiding people on site. Um, but I think that will hopefully be a way of showing them to then go and help themselves later um, because um things like we i made a, a a cheese out of flowering quince so um i thought i'd bring it to a community picnic in the summer and make have somebody make some scones or something and we can um, let everybody try it and say look it's nice and then when they're actually developed and it's grown then we can um have cookery events where we you know explain how to um, cook them and things um, we've done things like that in the past um, when the group was a bit younger um, how to make chutney and stuff and what we've also done is um, if any of if anyone else in any other town in the world wants to use the foraging um, booklet and make it their own we've registered it with creative commons and we're happy to send out the files and for other people to adapt it to their um, to their own area, whatever. So yeah, we've got the nuts um, ending the book and this little index um, so that you can find your way around it. 
and that's what the judging map is going to look like. So that will accompany the booklet, which we're very oh, excited okay. about. Yay! Yeah. Oh, just, and that's a lovely idea to be able to share it. Uh, are there any more questions from anyone? Yeah. Hmm? Awesome. I got a question. Uh, was this, what's the, how do you get water the, the place? What's the watering situation there as far as watering the plants at the beginning and so forth? The, um, there's actually a stream nearby. Um, so we've, uh, when we watered the cardboard around the trees originally, we were just able to dunk some um, bottles in the stream. Um, I don't think because of the actual situation of the thing, we don't be able to get any kind of, you know, permanent or semi-permanent structure in to get it from the stream. I think it's literally going to be by hand. Um, but we should be able to, um, I think there's a certain amount you can extract from a, a river um, before you have to have a license. So we need to figure out how much that is, but. Um, well, you have these kind of big plastic jerry cans that we've been hauling up and down, mm. um, or, or even better getting kids to haul up and down <laughs> on the community planting days. But yeah. um, we've just put in a, we've just put in for a grant to build um, what we're calling a community hub um, so basically a shed, sh like a glorified shed, but hopefully that will at least have um, a couple of water butts and some guttering on it so that we can start collecting water up, mm. sort of further up the field. Right, any more questions? Any questions? Yeah, um, luckily, luckily it, being in the southwest, we don't have. Um, we do tend to have a lot of rain. It's quite rare to have a drought, so hopefully, yeah, the nature will water it as well. Wonderful. And is your beautiful presentation available online? It's a really nice example that I'd like to show while I'm teaching. Is it? Uh, is it? <laughs> it could be. <laughs> it could be shortly. If you're like sharing. Yeah. No, no, we'd be very happy. Really to share. Very happy to share it. Um, we can put it. We can put it as a downloadable PDF on our website because we've got lots of, like our, our gardening for wildlife um, booklet and the map, and the foraging booklet are all free to download from our website. So we can just put it up there. That's not a problem. And I've got a, um, a blog of how to draw the map as well. If anybody wants to do one for their own town. Yeah, we lovely. basically really nice need to clone um, Helen and send her out into the world. <laughs> <laughs> um, could you put the address of your website in the in the chat? Yeah. Have it. Yeah, you've really put a lot of work in, and it really shows that you've taken a lot from the the permaculture course and the forest gardening perspective. Alex, you have a question. You're muted, though. You need to unmute. Yeah, that, that's an amazing, amazing project. It's kind of mind boggly large. So, <laughs> so, yeah. So, um, I was just wondering how you're kind of coping with the pesky bunnies, because um, I had some, I started a very, very small forest garden bit on an allotment last year and bunnies kind of decimated oh, everything, oh. um, even stuff I didn't think they'd eat, like onions, like they had walking onions, they had garlic chives they just munched everything right down um, I mean on on my allotment um I've had an allotment for about um 18 years and um the first thing we did was put a rabbit proof fence around it and I think um if you've got a small site just putting a fence around the whole thing is really helpful um because I think I got a little bit like Oh, rabbits aren't a problem, but it's only because it hadn't been a problem <laughs> for me. Um, and funny, funnily enough, they're not so much of a problem in the other sites. But something that we'd done, um, which was basically a way of doing something I'd seen online cheaper, is if you get um, square welded mesh, you can get it in a large roll. Um, and it's a, it's a real pain to cut up with um, hand tools, but you can put it through a... a saw if you've got um a steve in your group um, <laughs> um and um we do like these little uh, they're about a foot maybe a foot and a half diameter and we've been putting them around the shrubs 
um, and you can get the rolls in 90 centimeter wide so we've been cutting it on half so they're 45 centimeters high and about a foot and a half round and we put a little stake and then cable tie it onto the stake and we started off doing it because we were planting bushes in um, meadows that we had to scythe and we didn't want to scythe the bushes or lose it in the meadow um, and we also wanted to protect the small things from being trampled on by accident so we put we started off with them being like that but they do actually protect against rabbits because um, we've started using them on Fox's Field and the things that were getting decimated are now coming back um, I think we, we're slightly concerned about deer and we're hoping that maybe if we pee all around the perimeter we might keep the deer away but yeah I mean, there are some deer that we see in that field, but hopefully they're the small ones. <laughs> um, <laughs> cross that bridge, I think. <laughs> yeah, but there was a there was a day when I went out to sh sort of show off all our beautiful plants that we'd just put in with my son, and I was just like, "Oh my god!" They it's really yeah, like it's like demoralizing. Thank <laughs> you, humans, for giving us such a beautiful banquet. Yeah, we will now feast I think upon it. The uh, the ground cover is going to be quite interesting to get established. Um, and um, our one of our colleagues um, has a field out in the country, and she says actually just putting a piece of horticultural fleece over the lot when you plant it, weighing it down at the edges, that tends to um, uh, deter them. So I think we'll have to do that. In, the pa in patches as we plant the ground cover and actually just cover it in fleece until the plants are big enough to survive a bit of nibbling. That's and hopefully- That's a really good idea as well, yeah. Do, Although do quantity <laughs> as well. There Give was one, was that the, 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 my, my favorite bit of the meeting on, on the rabbit problem was someone saying, well, I can always order some lion, we can, get, we can just get some lion poo. <laughs> and I thought, oh, ha, 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 ha. yeah, good idea. It didn't Thing, work. And, and, and I thought she was joking, but no, she ordered some lion poo, which you can order from, from Amazon, zoos. I think, from zoos, <laughs> which comes in little sort of hard pellets. And it we, doesn't work. We put it around and the rabbits were like, yeah, bring them on. <laughs> bring Somerset on. lions, we'll have them, we'll eat them. I think if uh, they're not scared of the dogs that are all over that field, then they're probably not going to be worried about lions. <laughs> Anyway, and is there yeah. something you can do, like planting something that rabbits would enjoy more in the kind of larger area of the field that would give them? I'm, I'm quite interested in doing a large patch of green manure. Um, mm. And I think there are quite a lot of things in green manure that rabbits like. So maybe we can get it started off in a large area. Um, I think because that's going to help us develop the ground cover layer in stages and not have to do it all at once if we can try and suppress the grass first and then do maybe two or three years worth of green manures because they look beautiful as well if they've got flowers on and things like that it should be publicly pleasing um, but yeah maybe I think maybe the fodder radishes and things like that would be nice food for rabbits so maybe they'll keep their teeth off the other things. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think they always like chewing things, but also, yeah, when you have the trees, what I noticed in our place is that because we don't do the classical like tree pruning on all the small trees, like, you know, having the clear stem and then branching, we leave them like some of them more bushy as they would naturally be. And then this is quite good for the rabbits because they're kind of pruning the bottom of the trees, kind of chewing on the side stems and then not starting to chew on the, the bark of the, of the main stem of the tree. Brilliant, thank you. That's, That's really idea. helpful because yeah. um, one thing that we I, I was going to um, ask the group was um, I've got a lot of um, maiden whips in the apple trees and things and um, I really hate it when you get two-year-old apple trees and the orchard has pruned them really low and you never get a proper um, trunk of the tree um, and so I was tempted to not prune the maidens. Would you do that or would you always make them a bit shorter? Um, I guess it depends. I mean, a lot of trees, it would be interesting to hear what Rakesh says as well as to his strategy, but a lot of our trees, we kind of left them a little bit in the beginning and then we started to like reshape them kind of in the second or third year, but we weren't shaping them like so strongly because some of the trees you get from a nursery, you know, they've shaped it so you've just got like one long trunk and then it's just kind of branching off up at the top. Um, and we found, especially in our place where it's very windy and there can be rabbits and things like that, it's not very stable. It's kind of better to let it have its natural shape and then you can start to see kind of how it wants to grow. 
and then work with that. Okay. Yeah, no, that, that's exactly, exactly, exactly what I would do. So you allow it to grow to whatever size it wants to grow in whichever direction. And then after three, four years, you start seeing, all right, what shape do I actually now want it? And then you start pruning and training and, and forming the actual tree. So yeah, but give it yeah three, four years at least, depending on what tree it is. Good. I allow it to grow and allow it to strengthen itself. And then you've got lots of opportunities after that. It's, it's nice to be able to do something different than it's happened on the other plantings as well, because the other trees have all had their formative pruning by the nurseries. And um, I'm quite excited by seeing what they want to do on their own. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you need to, presumably they're grafted. So you just need to watch which ones are coming up. Are they part of the... The scion or the, the yeah the, the, root the rootstock. Stock. So if it's part of the rootstock, then you, those parts of males will cut off immediately uh, and keep what's ever's coming from the scion. Brilliant. Excellent. So I'm yeah, uh, I'm impressed with your triangulation. I guess <laughs> one question I have though is, did you compensate for the fact that it's a three-dimensional triangulation because you're going up and downhill? Or it's not. It's pretty level. Is it? Yeah. There's. There's. It's. It's pretty flat field, really. I mean, there's. There's the odd up and down, but not. Not in the. Um. Yeah. You wouldn't really notice it. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe that's why we would. Um. A few meters out in various places, but yeah, you wouldn't really notice the level. Okay. Rakesh, don't make us go re remeasure everything. Oh, but... <laughs> So, um, yeah, when are you inviting me back? Oh, anytime. Anytime in the summer. Actually, we've got, well, we've got, uh, Helen's worked out weekly community planting days. Oh, not planting days, gardening but things, gardening yeah. days um, yeah. up until June now. So we'll send you a list and, uh, yeah, come down and, and have some fun with the mulch. Uh, so I'm going to be in Belkshire, I think, September and October. And so, yeah. Yeah, that'd be ideal because we want to have our hub built by then. Ooh, yes. Ooh, hub. All right. Send us lots of good vibes for getting all this money. For yeah. The <laughs> if you want me to do either a one day or a two day workshop, like a forest garden course for some of the new people who are coming through as well, maybe we can even organize something like that. So, yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Cool. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Really amazing to see. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Um, we actually yeah, have, sorry, we have we have to jump onto just another really quick zoom with our colleagues.